Hello, I'm Dr. Craig Wiener from the University of Massachusetts Medical School and private practitioner for 40 years. Welcome to the final installment of the video series ADHD, A Return to Psychology. This video series critiques our usual understandings of the diagnosis of ADHD and our most popular ways of trying to help individuals who are labeled attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. The series is based on three books which I wrote over the past decade. The last of which is a parenting book which makes the ideas accessible in an easy to read format. Today's theme is Medicate and Coerce or Develop Self-Reliance and Cooperation. This video focuses primarily upon ADHD treatment. So everyone agrees that individuals diagnosed with ADHD don't manage their lives in socially approved ways. It's widely accepted that their improper behaviors occur because of a neurodevelopmental delay that renders them less able to grasp the consequences of their actions. In this popular view, individuals diagnosed with ADHD have more difficulty than others holding back what they desire. They act before recognizing what is likely to happen in the future. Individuals who study the ADHD problem are not surprised that a sit-down test will not help to make a reliable diagnosis. In their view, ADHD plays out as the individual lives in the world in a rating scale which gauges the day-to-day -day behaviors of the person are a much better way to assess the kinds of problems that are typically caused by the inhibitory delay called ADHD. Only treatments that permeate the individual's daily life will be helpful. That's why there's so much focus on developing drugs to remediate the condition and so much stress on having others provide the control that the individual lacks. Once a drug is ingested, that kind of treatment will be with the individual throughout the day. And if those responsible for socializing the person change the environment to make consequences apparent in the moment, those maneuvers might also have utility. Individuals diagnosed with ADHD cannot be relied upon to manage themselves no matter how much training they received. In this popular view, their inhibitory deficit will prevent them from enacting what they know at the point of performance. Well, as you can see, the presumption of incompetence discounts the possibility of trying to help an individual learn to be more self-reliant and cooperative. Interventions which permeate the ecology of the person's day-to-day -day life and drugs which alter the person's neurobiology are much more likely to be helpful according to traditional beliefs. This video will examine those assertions and present the advantages of trying to help an individual learn to be more autonomous and to be more participatory and mutual in their exchanges with others. Before moving on, let's first have a quick review of parts one and two of the video series. In part one, I talked about the problem of the view that a person has to inhibit themselves in order to manage the future successfully. But in order to know when to inhibit, a person would already have to know ahead of time that an action could be a mistake. But if that were the case, they would already have to be aware of the future. They would not have to be inhibiting to become aware. Yes, sometimes people do stop themselves prior to or during a response, but that occurs when they recognize that there could be a problem with what they're doing. In the view presented here, past learning exposures will account for whether or not a person impedes their actions. In part two, the view is presented that biological observations don't inform us about the causes of ADHD. For example, if you're comparing the brains of diagnosed individuals with the brains of non-diagnosed individuals and you notice differences, all that can be reasonably said is that you're observing the consequence of the co-occurrence of biology and environment because we know that experiences change the way the brain develops. Yes, there are biological characteristics that can change the probability that ADHD patterns will evolve later on, although that does not represent fate or predestination because not all individuals with those early occurring 
biological characteristics eventually go on to show ADHD behaviors. So we know that there must be some kinds of environmental variations that produce significant effects. In the view presented here, it's important to remember that learning can change biology, including when genes turn on and off. In the view presented here, history of conditioning can adequately account for the frequency rates of ADHD behaviors. ADHD behaviors seem to be much more situational and under environmental control than a developmental delay such as intellectual delay or a pervasive language delay. So instead of emphasizing biology as a way to account for ADHD behaviors, an assessment focuses much more upon identifying contingencies of reinforcement. Let's take a look at these situational variations. As illustrated by Brian Nelson, hyperactivity might occur when the parent is on the phone, but not if bedtime is extended while the parent talks. Distractibility might prevail when the child is required to write a thank you note, but not when the child is writing a Christmas list. The daily planner might be cast aside while plans on the internet are being made. Chores might be left undone, but the house might sparkle when the child is buttering up the parent. Traditionists have had to account for these kinds of situational variations, as sometimes the individual diagnosed with ADHD will show reasonably competent behavior and at other times very problematic behaviors. Let's see how traditionalists attempt to resolve these concerns. Well, importantly, traditional explanation seems to be very inadequate when accounting for situational variations. In what seems to be confirmation bias, traditionalists might posit that there could be mitigating circumstances. For example, if they don't notice that the individual is showing ADHD behaviors, they might say that the situation isn't taxing the individual's inhibitory system. But since no taxing measurements are provided, this seems to be a non-refutable post hoc assertion. Similarly, they might posit that there could be extenuating circumstances. If they notice that the individual is behaving competently, they might say it must be that the individual is interested, and they make the case that ADHD does not occur when a person is interested. So if they notice that ADHD isn't occurring, they can always say that the person must have been interested, and it becomes a non-refutable post hoc assertion. Claims of extenuating circumstances and mitigating circumstances make it difficult to identify data which might bring into question the view that ADHD represents a neurodevelopmental delay that disrupts functioning in some kind of coherent fashion. During therapy sessions, it is not at all unusual to hear diagnosed children trying to convince their parents that they still have time to stop at the toy store, even though the parents want to get home for a particular time to start supper, and they still have to pick up a sibling at a friend's house. Interestingly enough, the child's estimates of the time frames are relatively accurate, even though the child is supposed to have difficulty grasping time and managing time due to their ADHD. Very similarly, it is not unusual to find diagnosed individuals studying strategy guides to improve their gameplay even though they purportedly have difficulty preparing for their future, and that is why they often fail to study for examinations for school. While traditionalists who defend the biological model would say that you can't make this comparison, because the strategy guide does not tax the inhibitory system in that it exudes immediate reinforcement to the individual, that's only the case when a person is already conditioned to associate pleasure with playing and learning about the game. For many others, the same book might be a complete turnoff. Likewise, there are many diagnosed children who are immersed in pro wrestling statistics. They know about each wrestler, their strengths and weaknesses, 
and what has happened in past events and what is likely to happen in the future because they understand the storyline that has been occurring all along. While ADHD is supposedly going to impair their working memory and their time horizon, they seem to function quite well when talking about pro wrestling. It is also not unusual to find diagnosed children arranging intricate battle scenes with toy figures where there are subtle interactions between the figures and where figures are placed strategically to promote an interesting battle. While these same children are supposed to have difficulty organizing schoolwork and their messy backpacks because of their ADHD, they show very good organizational skill when engaged in these kinds of activities. If it's always possible to explain away competencies that are supposed to be disrupted by ADHD by claiming that the person must have been interested or that the activity doesn't tax the inhibitory system because it gives off immediate reinforcements, then what kind of data can be produced which would be a disconfirming event? All of this reminds me of the following cartoon. It makes no difference what I say. You've already decided that I'm guilty. The witch can read minds. The traditional account for ADHD also introduces another dilemma or dualism. That is, many parents ask how much of an individual's forgetfulness or failure to follow instruction is disobedience or psychological and how much of it is a biologically based inattention. Well, traditionalists acknowledge that there's no reliable way to distinguish lack of compliance from ADHD. So the problem remains, why would a biogenetic problem that disrupts neural development respond so remarkably to bribery, personal interests, or the source of the instruction to do the activity, such as whether the activity is self-initiated by the individual or required by others? Again, how can you exceed your disability? Many parents ask, why can my child function so well when she is doing what she wants to do? What if we drop the problematic biological view of ADHD and return to a psychological account? As theorized by Sigmund Freud a century ago, behaviors that seem to be malfunctions such as blurting out, risk-taking, not following through, forgetting, breaking things, misplacing or losing objects, are not necessarily devoid of psychological meaning or devoid of some kind of advantage to the individual, even if the advantage is not conscious to the individual who enacts the behaviors. Given all the problems and shortcomings associated with the biological view of ADHD, it's not unreasonable to ask, does a person have ADHD or does a person do ADHD? However, if you look at the diagnostic manual and read the behaviors that are associated with ADHD, you notice that they are framed in a way which suggests that something is acting upon the individual, and there is no sense that the individual's behavior coordinates with any kind of advantage or outcome. For example, one behavior is that the person is unable to listen when spoken to directly. Rather than describing the behavior as the person's not complying, the person might be thought of as being disorganized rather than the person doesn't put things away in designated places because they're not taking the time and energy to do so. Or the individual is apparently driven by a motor rather than describing the individual as energetic or eliciting attention. Or they might say that the person blurts out as if they can't control themselves rather than saying the person's striking back or being noticed or creating a stir. They might say that the person's impulsive rather than saying that the person's emotional, desperate, or indulging. They might say that the person makes careless mistakes as if they are happening out of the person's control rather than saying the person's rushing to finish or might depend on others to correct the mistakes. So what are the advantages that might coincide with ADHD behaviors? Well, the first would be avoidance of discomfort. 
Now, many of the behaviors that are described as distractibility or inattentiveness could be reframed as avoidance responses in a psychological sense. ADHD behaviors that are antagonistic to others can also be reinforced when they result in achieving revenge or power over someone else. But there's also a significant interaction that occurs when the individual is antagonistic. Often, the antagonizer can produce an intense reaction from the other person, and then the antagonizer can claim that they have been victimized by the other person's response. Often, they can get the other person to feel guilty about their actions and feel sorry for them. And the other person might often try to make reparations as a way to resolve the problem. It seems as if instigating can be quite a powerful behavior. A third reinforcement for ADHD behaviors is accommodation or an easing of requirements. Please turn it down. Daddy's trying to do your homework. Well, while it's sometimes necessary to ease requirements, to jumpstart success, or to stop a sense of futility, unless the easement is systematically withdrawn in relation to increasing success, the individual does not progress and might get attached to the benefit. Whenever allowances are made for a behavior, you run the risk of encouraging more of that behavior. Well, if concern for individuals diagnosed with ADHD Many interventions are accommodating, such as assigning an aid to assist with schoolwork or allowing increased time to complete assignments or assigning less amount of work. When ADHD is considered a permanent disability, then it's often the case that these procedures are never curtailed and progress is stifled. A fourth reinforcement for ADHD behaviors is acquisition of what might not have otherwise been obtained. Often the person oversteps bounds in an emotionally charged way and avoids missing out and avoids having to wait. The behaviors produce the desired effect very quickly. A fifth reinforcement for ADHD behaviors is attention. Now while other ADHD behaviors will evoke responses from others, this particular set of behaviors has to do with the child behaving in a way which gets them to be noticed or helps them to remain socially focal when that might not have otherwise been the case. Now the child might do a behavior which is playful or entertaining or a behavior which gets others to become more concerned about them. But generally the behaviors are playful and rambunctious. And while sometimes a child might go a little too far and get others to be irritated because they are too goofy or extreme and silly, the behaviors usually have to do with something more positive. Being loud and rambunctious can certainly have its advantages. If we adopt the perspective that ADHD behaviors are a way to adapt and cope in the world, you can ask the question, who is controlling who? Watch what I can make Pavlov do. As soon as I drool, he'll smile and write in his little book. Let's take some examples of the reinforcements for ADHD behaviors so you can get a better understanding of when to apply the labels. So let's take the first one. Your child's dancing in front of a stranger in the waiting room while you're reading a magazine. You ask her to come to you and look at the pictures in the magazine you're reading. So what would be the reinforcement? Attention. Your child trips his sister. You yell at him. He sticks out his tongue and you go after him. Antagonism. Your child reaches quickly to get food before others and knocks over his milk. You clean up the spill while your child continues to eat. Acquisition. Your child is groaning and saying, I can't, while cleaning her room. You go into the room and take over the job. Accommodation. You ask your daughter to help you put away the groceries, but she keeps watching the television without responding. You keep calling her and continue to put things away. 
avoidance. I've previously noted that ADHD behaviors typically occur under particular sets of conditions. So what kinds of context, situations, and circumstances are more likely to elicit ADHD behaviors and reinforce those actions and reactions? Well, situations where there is a great deal of disapproval, the likelihood of failure, when the individual feels insecure, when the individual has difficulty comprehending what is happening, when the individual feels a loss of authority, when an unwelcome transition is imposed on the person, when the individual has to endure an assignment that is given to them, when the individual feels socially excluded or evaluated by others, when they have to endure extended speaking or long-winded lectures, when the person is denied from what they initiate and enjoy, when they feel restricted, or when their actions are directed, or when they're told they should do something or have to do something. These are the kinds of conditions that are most likely to elicit ADHD actions and reactions. Now, there are also conditions under which ADHD responses are very unlikely and rare. For example, when the individual is comfortable in a situation and or doing activity that they initiate and have historically enjoyed. When the situation is associated with successes, when the individual feels competent, when the individual has retained their discretionary authority about what is going to happen, and when they feel socially accepted, ADHD behaviors are very unlikely to occur under these sets of context situations and circumstances. Here's a useful dichotomy which might help to predict when ADHD behaviors are likely or unlikely to be enacted. Well, if it's someone else's agenda, ADHD behaviors are more probable. And if it's the child's agenda, then ADHD behaviors are improbable. You might think of ADHD behaviors as failures to accommodate to social limits and expectations. The immature kinds of infringements and avoidances which most people do to some extent, but ADHD individuals do to the extreme. Now it's not surprising that group settings often correlate with frequent ADHD behaviors. Individuals' interests and discretionary authority are typically diminished in a group setting, and the individual has to adapt themselves to what the group is doing rather than promote their own interests and concerns. Now, it's very important for a child to learn to function adequately within a group, and this is particularly true for a school where most of what happens occurs within groups. Parents of children who have been diagnosed with ADHD will often notice that when the family is convening, the child often drifts off and does not participate. That is, unless the child is monopolizing what is happening. So it's important for any competent ADHD intervention to help the child learn to function well in groups and learn to adapt themselves to a group agenda. Since the child's group behavior within the family can repeat at school, it, parents are in a unique position to help prepare the child for school by helping them to function adequately in the family group. So how might parents accomplish this? Well, they can convene more often as a whole group, such as eating meals together or doing other kinds of activities. They can acknowledge the child's competence when the child participates in the group. They can ask for her opinion. They can let her take the lead and they can pick up on subjects that she likes. Individuals might take shorter turns so that no one monopolizes and they might be careful not to reinforce off-task behaviors. Parents are promoting the child's involvement with the group by enjoying the child's participation and willingness to stay current with what is being discussed. It's important for the parent not to respond to complaints of boredom or to inadvertently reinforce immature silliness by responding to these kinds of behaviors. If the parent notices that the child is cheating during a board game, stay calm, abide by the rules, and move on without playing into the drama. Losing or not getting one's own way is a frequent issue for those diagnosed with ADHD. 
Now let's get into the nitty-gritty of comparing traditional ADHD intervention with the intervention advocated here, which is to promote self-reliance and cooperation. Now in traditional ADHD intervention, the benefits are that there are rapid results and ease of use. Traditional ADHD interventions based on medication, compensation, and stringent discipline. Most parents find it easier to coerce and dominate a child than to try to negotiate a more mutually acceptable social interaction. And administering drugs only requires the child to take the drug. Those who endorse traditional ADHD medicinal therapy are fervent proponents of the view that ADHD medications are the best way to help people who have been diagnosed with ADHD. They argue that ADHD drugs are the safest and most well-studied of all psychiatric medications. It is now so widely accepted that ADHD medications are necessary throughout the person's lifetime that more than 10,000 toddlers were being given ADHD medications in 2014, even though those usages were not endorsed by pediatric guidelines. The usage of ADHD medications is permeating our society. For example, psychostimulant prescriptions increased by 344% from 2003 to 2015 for women who are still in their reproductive ages of 15 to 44. The largest increase occurred for women between the ages of 25 and 29. However, are these drugs as safe and effective as proponents are advising? Well, according to Consumer Reports, ADHD drugs do help people become less hyperactive and impulsive and they're better able to focus, and they're less disruptive at home and school. However, according to Consumer Reports, there is no good evidence showing that those benefits last longer than two years. Along these same lines, the province of Quebec did a study asking the question, do stimulant medications improve educational and behavioral outcomes for children with ADHD? What they found was that there was little evidence of improvement in either the medium or long term. Expanding medication in a community setting had little positive benefit and may have had harmful effects given the average way these drugs are used in the community. Similarly, in a review of 2,287 studies, the Drug Effectiveness Review Project found that there is no good quality evidence on the use of drugs to affect outcomes related to global academic performance, the consequences of risky behaviors, and social achievements. In Western Australia's long-term study of ADHD drugs, the conclusion was that medication does not translate into long-term benefits to the child's social and emotional outcomes, school-based performance, or symptom improvement. Certainly medicinal therapy is advisable when the benefits outweigh the risks, but let's look at the possible downside whenever there is chronic use of any kind of medication. Well, first off, in the case of ADHD medications, most data is relatively short-term in nature, and the positive findings are often in the short term. Additionally, data is now accumulating that there is diminishing benefits for ADHD medications the longer people rely on these medications for treatment. While proponents of ADHD medication are arguing that the drugs are not addictive, and some are making the case that they can be reparative in some ways, there are others who are concerned that the longer term use of these drugs could lead to unwanted biological changes. With psychiatric medications in general, there has been concern that the chronic administration of these kinds of drugs can lead to substantial and long-lasting alteration in a person's neural functioning. 
There is the added concern that individuals who ingest ADHD medications get used to functioning on the medications and they learn to do certain kinds of socially required activity only when in a drug-induced state. They fail to learn how to adapt to these context situations and circumstances without being on a medication. While the drugs wash out of the body relatively quickly and are not addictive in the same sense that heroin might be addictive, individuals who miss doses notice a significant deterioration in their functioning and it's important for them to immediately get back to taking the medications to return to baseline. In that sense, it's not clear whether there is both psychological and some physiological acclimation to the drug usage. There's also the problem that individuals who take ADHD medications begin to see the medications as the cure. And it's not surprising that they feel this way because this is what they are told. They adopt the perspective that they can't succeed in life without the drugs. Moreover, the more they stay on the drugs, the more likely they are to be prescribed additional drugs as the benefits of the singular medication start to diminish over the years. So now we have many individuals relying completely on medicinal therapy and being exposed to the consequences and side effects of not only one drug, but multiple drugs. And all along, other treatments are being ignored. For example, for children ages two to five, 75% of these children are on medication and less than 50% of these children get any kind of psychological help whatsoever. There is yet another very significant problem with medicinal therapy. The drugs work so quickly that the drugs remove urgency. Urgency is what gets people to work hard to change, but the drugs lull the individual into the belief that the problem is permanently solved. Other treatments which might have been enacted are not tried. If the problems recur years later, all the time is lost that could have been spent on doing interventions that could have had more long-lasting effects. According to Alan Strove, who is one of the most outstanding developmental psychologists in the country, attention deficit drugs increase concentration in the short term, which is why they work so well for college students cramming for exams. Well, when given to children over long periods of time, they neither improve school achievement nor reduce behavioral problems. To date, no study has found any long-term benefit of attention deficit medication on academic performance, peer relationships, or behavioral problems, the very things we would want most to improve. The drugs can also have serious side effects, including stunting growth. Now let's talk about the kinds of psychosocial interventions that are designed by traditionalists who believe that ADHD represents a neurodevelopmental delay. The kinds of interventions that are recommended are always based on the idea that the person possesses a limitation in their ability to function and therefore any competent intervention has to compensate for what is lacking within the individual. ADHD interventions, which presume a permanent disability, are based on accommodation, surveillance, and coercion. Individuals who are responsible to socialize the diagnosed individual are asked to bring the future into the present because the individual has less ability to allow the future to influence their actions. Those responsible are encouraged to remind the diagnosed person, to offer commands rather than make compliance seem less of a necessity. They are asked to bring the future into the present by making signs, by giving the person a timer so that the person can be more aware of time frames, and they are asked to make rewards and punishments much more immediate because the person will not be influenced by a future reward or a future punishment. Contingency management becomes the foundation of the traditional intervention. Other people control 
the access that the diagnosed person has to their resources. Access is either denied or granted based on compliance. In that regard, the system is coercive. But there can be considerable side effects when other people control a person's access to their resources, when others employ the tactics that are recommended by traditionalists. But the presumption of disability always takes treatment in this direction. When behaviors are learned in the presence of a manager who is forcing compliance, the behaviors might occur in the manager's presence, but they are much less likely when the management is not available to supervise. In a similar vein, Leper showed that bribing children to paint by promising a reward resulted in the children painting less than what had been occurring prior to the experiment when they took the reward away. Adding the reward reduced the amount of self-initiated painting that the children did. In this regard, many parents complain that their child will not help unless they're promised a reward, but that's precisely what happens when you socialize children to do socially desired behaviors with contingency management. The activity gets diminished and the reward becomes the focus. Much like drugs, you might get an instant result at the cost of a longer term problem. The important point is that traditional methods do not nurture self-discipline or mutuality. The individual is conditioned to respond to a world that is altered by others to pressure compliance. The individual does not learn to behave competently apart from those who manage and coerce. Now, if the person is disabled, there isn't much downside. But what if it is possible to develop more self-reliance? And what if the person could learn to do socially desired behaviors with less coercion? Moreover, once traditional interventions are implemented, there's a risk of not only increasing the individual's dependency, but there is a risk of creating other secondary effects which imitate any other kind of institutionalized training. Individuals are not blocks of wood. They will learn to adapt and cope to what is happening around them. They might learn to evade as a way to prevent others from controlling their access to resources. They might learn to sneak and lie and maneuver so that they can maintain what they initiate and enjoy. They might also learn to procrastinate as a way to resist the coercions, but that might only lead to an escalation of more coercion to regain compliance. They might learn to withhold information so that the manager does not have access to the information which would lead to some kind of reprisal. Some individuals might become increasingly anxious in relation to the possibility of being punished and others might learn to be very submissive so that they will not suffer any kind of reprisal. Some might learn to do only minimal conformity and just enough to avoid the punishments that might occur. Others might become angry because other people are trying to control their world and they might learn a variety of behaviors to gain revenge and retaliation. Individuals might also become less interested in having relationships with others as relationships become associated with power and control. The focus is much more upon what goods and services the individual can have access to, and there is less focus on the value of a caring relationship. Since it is not unusual for people to imitate the behaviors that they see, many individuals exposed to contingency management might also learn to be rigid and coercive because that is what the managers are doing. And since the managers are punishing, then the individuals who are receiving the punishment might learn to punish back by being spiteful and or by doing negative attention provoking, which will anger and punish those that are trying to control them. It would seem as if all the behaviors just listed are more likely if parents follow the dictum of regaining control over the child's world, which is the recommendation of the traditional approach. Traditionalists might emphasize that their programs focus more upon rewards than upon punishments. But withholding a reward differs only very slightly from imposing a punishment. Similarly, 
Traditionists might say that these management systems don't have to be predicated upon material goods. Rewards can be based on spending increased time with each other. However, in this regard, there's a difference between earning time with someone and someone wanting to spend time together. The entire endeavor is fraught with problems. Often individuals are initially fine with the program. They think they're now getting something when they had previously had to do the same behavior without the extra reward. However, the early success quickly fades. Problems arise as soon as the first reward is withheld or the first punishment is imposed. Those being managed try to get more for doing less, and managers try to get more while giving less. Those confined learn ways to escape and avoid, and monitors work hard to plug loopholes. The arrangement is adversarial rather than cooperative, is likely to make collaboration even harder to achieve in the future because what is learned has to be undone. No one is spending time developing patterns of interaction that develop mutuality. After some early success, individuals often abandon their chips and charts. Except for simple tasks, developing autonomy, mastery, and purpose motivate better. It's the difference between inducing compliance versus developing engagement. However, with the traditional approach, personal gain rather than mutual gain becomes the focus of what is beneficial to the individual. If positive and caring relationships correspond with personal happiness, then the child is patterned to neglect that important factor. What chance does the child have in developing satisfying relationships if we fail to help the child see the joy that comes with mutuality and cooperation. Now I'm going to shift gears and I'm going to present an intervention that is predicated upon developing a person's self-reliance and interest in cooperating with others. To start, if ADHD is unlikely when a child is interested, why not design a treatment that increases the child's interest in doing valued behaviors? An intervention that develops the workings of working memory, personal responsibility, and the benefits that relate to developing concern for others. Where individuals learn to do valued responses with less coercion and without the presumption that they are disabled. Where the child's self-managed skills are cultivated. For example, the child will learn to turn off the lights because if they fail to learn those behaviors, they will help pay the light bill. Here are the basic procedures. Participants help each other recognize the benefits and side effects of ADHD behavior. They learn to talk about what is reinforcing the current behaviors without criticism or blame. The discussion revolves around what might be the advantages to the behavior and why the individual might want to give that behavior up. Parents are encouraged to make changes that discourage ADHD behavior. For example, instead of talking in front of the child about how active the child is to others, the parent might stop those behaviors and the parent might learn to respond to the child's rambunctiousness without as much emotion or attention. Those assisting will also help to promote acceptable behaviors with the least amount of coercion. They help the individual identify positive alternative actions and outcomes by exploring complications, harms, and obstacles that are likely to be encountered when a particular solution is enacted. They will help to increase the individual's self-help skills and decrease dependency. They will do this by helping the child become more aware of past successes in similar situations. For example, the parent might talk about how the child has learned so many facts about various kinds of Pokemon and that they can use that same skill to learn their multiplication problems. The emphasis is upon helping the child learn to manage without parental cue or reminder. Lastly, but importantly, parents and children address and resolve problems that disrupt their relationship. If an individual notices that another participant is not very happy about what is happening, that problem is addressed as soon as possible. When developing self-reliance and cooperation, 
the child is treated as competent to succeed, adults seek her input and value her opinion. There is also an attempt to get buy-in from the child rather than compliance. So the adult looks to see whether the child gives us a sign of affirmation, such as a positive head nod, or something else that indicates that the child is willing or wants to do the solution that is being talked about. There is no interest in getting the child to simply say whatever the parent wants to hear in order to get the transaction to stop occurring. The adult works to help promote the child's problem-solving initiatives and independence. For example, rather than train the child to rely upon reminders and parental cues and directives, the child specifies when, where, and how the solution will be enacted independently. The parent promotes the benefits of independence by saying such things as, would you like to complete this on your own so you'll be able to do it when I'm not around? The adult helps the child identify solutions that are positive to the child. They do this by asking the child a variety of questions such as, how do you want to handle that problem? What could you do to take better care of yourself when you're in that situation? Will that be an improvement for you? What changes will help us? What do we do if the problem keeps happening? Now when this intervention is first being enacted, it's not unusual for the child to simply say, I don't know when a parent asks these kinds of questions. The child has not yet learned ways to participate in problem solving, and their ideation has not been developed. I call this the I don't know syndrome. The child might say, maybe, kinda, sorta, yep, I don't care, what, huh, I guess, sure. What do you want me to say? I have no clue. This will occur frequently when you want him to talk about an issue. It can feel like pulling teeth to get him to connect with you and problem solve together. Often he half heartily shrugs or looks away and fidgets with a toy instead of gazing in your direction. This way of responding has probably been brewing for quite some time. It's hard to reach him and he maintains control over you when you beg him to respond or you keep repeating yourself. So how might you get more contribution from the child? Well, you can talk with him about the consequences of leaving the problem unsolved. Does he want to live with those consequences? Is he prepared to have you solve the problem without his input? Is he comfortable giving you the message that the problem and the solution simply don't matter? It's also important for the parent to talk with the child in a positive tone of voice, as this might help him relax and open up. He can make the problem seem less intimidating and overwhelming and ask him to say whatever ideas come to mind without worrying about whether he's right or wrong. You also might have to ask him the same question in many different ways before you get him to respond. Often the child might say, I don't know, but if you just keep with it, he'll come up with something relatively quickly. You could say, what if you took a guess? Remember, you're training the child to be more assertive, so make it safe for him to be candid about how he thinks and feels. Ask him, what's the worst thing that could happen if you told me what you think? Or reassure him that you'll remain positive and reasonable and encourage him to tell you when he's upset. Rather than lecture, try to create a volley. Try to develop a comfortable exchange where each individual is taking a relatively short turn. Share the floor. Say your ideas as simply as possible. Allow him to initiate and engage and express his ideas. React to his taking the lead rather than dominate the interaction. Help him recognize that his ideas are important and that they can help to determine family policy. Demonstrate you're willing to work hard to understand his point of view. After he speaks, you can say back what you think he said and ask him, did I get that right? Allow him time to speak and complete his ideas before jumping in. Now, if you're unsure of what he's saying, you could encourage him to clarify. You could say such things as, Would you make that easier for me to understand? I don't want to miss out on what you're saying. Now, you also want to check to make sure he's comfortable with what you're saying. You could ask him, Well, how do you feel about it if we did it that way? Is it something that will work for you? 
Notice when he's disengaging and immediately address that problem. It's pointless to continue if he's dropping out of the interaction. If he rolls his eyes, frowns, or looks away, or changes the subject and starts to fidget, find out what he doesn't like about what is happening. You could say such things as, you don't look very excited, what are you feeling, or what gave you trouble with what I just said? What would be a better way for us to solve this, or what can I do to make it easier for you to talk with me? All of these interactions will help to mitigate the I don't know syndrome. In this alternative intervention, parents are developing the child's concern for others, and they model the behaviors that they want the child to enact. For example, rather than order the child to shut off the TV, they might say something like, when the advertisement comes on, would you please pick up the toys? This will help the child recognize that the parent is concerned about what they are doing and not just selfishly ordering the child around. The hope is that the child will learn to imitate these behaviors and show reciprocity in the same way. Both parents and children are simultaneously learning to consider multiple perspectives as they socialize each other. They learn to understand the difficulties that each individual encounters when they face various kinds of situations. Compassion is developed. They focus on individual and family benefits when resolving problems. This current intervention emphasizes sharing, compromise, turn-taking, mutuality, and acts of kindness, and it helps the child develop consistent routines that the child can enact autonomously. It is not a permissive method, as the hope is that the child will do socially valued behaviors, but do these behaviors with less coercion. It is not an advisement for parents to sit back and allow the child to misbehave or get themselves in danger. The parent takes assertive action and will stop facilitating whenever the child is intrusive or exploiting others. The parent is not accommodating to negative behaviors. The parent is more often letting the child experience natural consequences, but they are not allowing the child to be in danger. The parent becomes unyielding when risks and infringements are too great. For example, after all the discussion, if the child still is not wearing a helmet, it might be necessary for the parent to lock up the child's bike until that problem can be resolved. The methods advocated here are well documented. There is much empiricism to support the view that these methods facilitate goal achievement, stop avoidance behaviors, and help to nurture positive relationships, resiliency, and empathy for others. Along these lines, in a meta-analysis for persons with disabilities, it was found that providing choice opportunities resulted in clinically significant reductions in the number of occurrences of problem behaviors. Now in this final section, I'm going to present 10 guiding principles that can help to develop self-reliance and cooperation. The first principle is use coercion as a last resort. When behaviors are learned with reduced coercion, interest is increased, and your child will more likely cooperate and achieve even when you're not there. As a way to promote less coercive exchanges with the child, it's often helpful if the parent changes the manner in which they speak with the child, as well as alter vocabulary. You can stop the video and look at some of these exemplars to get an idea of what is possible. The second principle is stay calm. The parent could say, I know you're angry, but I can hear you better if you talk quietly. Remember, staying composed mitigates the troublesome pattern of fighting and making up, and the guilt that occurs when individuals treat each other harshly. As mentioned earlier, this is not a passive or permissive intervention. The parent actively takes steps to address and resolve problems. For example, the parent might say, I haven't been getting enough time on the computer. Let's figure out a way to take turns. The fourth principle is be patient. It can take many trials to learn new behaviors. Now this applies to both the child and the parent as these methods often take a substantial amount of time for a parent to learn and master, and the child is unlikely to immediately learn a cooperative pattern after many years of adversarial interacting. We all know that old habits are hard to break. 
The fifth principle is suspend judgment. If the child anticipates a corrective encounter where the parent is going to operate as a judge and jury, a variety of ADHD behaviors are likely to be triggered. For example, if the parent says, this report card looks terrible, they are likely to get a different reaction than if they say, how do you feel about this report card? What do you like about it? Is there anything you want to change? The hope is that the child develops an internal locus of control in relation to schoolwork and wants to become a serious student. This shift seems less likely when the child is often feeling pressured in relation to their schoolwork. Even when the parent evaluates in a positive fashion, there can be negative effects as well. For example, if the parent says, you could get all A's if you would only try, the child might become even more anxious about trying because what if they tried and they still failed? Would that mean that they are no longer smart? Next, it's important to recognize that limits can be stated negatively or they can be stated in a positive fashion, which might help the child recognize the advantages that correspond with the limits, as well as help the limits sound less depriving. For example, the parent might say, you can't have snacks before dinner, but they could also say, let's keep our appetites. We can eat together real soon. The parent might say, don't bother me right now, or the parent might say, I can play in a little while. As noted throughout, this intervention treats the child as competent to succeed. Instead of saying, you have to read the directions, the parent might say, how can you find out what to do? Instead of saying, let me help you, the parent could say, I'm available if you'd like to talk things over. Often children with ADHD are anxious about failing and they feel inferior. That's why they often avoid and don't try or give up quickly. They might interpret an offer of help as an innuendo that they are incompetent, and often they don't react well. Approaching them in this new way can ameliorate this problem. The eighth tenet is establish buy-in. When your child's comfortable with what's happening, the child's more likely to cooperate and do his part. Well, how do you promote a child's input when wanting to solve a problem? Find out what the child wants to do to solve the problem. Hold back from offering solutions and treat the child as capable of working on the solution. Give the child time to break silences. React to her rather than have her react to you. If there's a long pause, ask her what she's thinking about. Treat her as the expert. Ask questions that explore her ideas. Ask questions if you think there might be a problem with her solution. Well, what might happen if we take your friend with us without telling her parents? If you have an idea, find out whether she likes it. What if you took the trash out the night before? Check to see whether she's satisfied with the solution. Next, it's important to assert yourself. Socializing a child with less coercion doesn't mean that the child is controlling you more. For example, the parent might say, I'm happy to keep buying these snacks if we figure out a way to share them, instead of having to put up with constant fighting and or put up with all the wrappers around the house and picking them up like a maid or butler, the parent can also stop repeating and take action after saying things once. Finally, and very importantly, you're fostering your child's independence. For example, instead of ordering your child's meal at a restaurant, you might orient in ways that help the child order his own meal. You're promoting the child's initiatives and self-care. The child's ideas and skills are noticed and valued. And when the child performs a task on his own, the competency is noticed. For example, you might ask the child, what can you do to help yourself remember to brush your teeth at night? If the child thinks that a sign would help, so be it. At least the child has taken the action to make the sign and put the sign in a place where the child thinks it will be helpful and the child is managing on an independent basis. If it turns out that the child's idea of making a sign didn't help, ask him if he understands why and whether he has other ideas. For example, he might eventually figure out that if he puts the sign near his pajamas, he will eventually develop a bedtime routine which includes brushing his teeth. It might take multiple trials for a workable solution to be found. Very similarly, rather than pressuring him to do chores with contingency management or reminding him and directing him to do a chore, you want him to learn to take charge of an activity and carry it out independently. If he is resistive, you want to figure out why that might be occurring 
and you want the child to observe how family members greatly appreciate individuals who make contributions to the running of the family. Now I'm going to wrap things up by making some concluding remarks regarding the ADHD theory that underlies and justifies the problematic ADHD interventions that are now so prevalent. It's conjecture, not fact, that people diagnosed with ADHD need point of performance intervention more than others to stop problematic behaviors. You could alternatively say it takes a lot of monitoring to coerce change. It's conjecture, not fact, that point of performance intervention helps because it's compensating for a lesser ability to recognize consequences. But do smokers keep smoking because of an inability to see consequences? You could alternatively say point of performance intervention makes it more worthwhile for individuals to comply. Well, it's conjecture, not fact, that behaviors leading to longer term achievements are not also immediately reinforced. As discussed in part one, the miser can be reinforced each time he accumulates money, even though we think he is delaying gratification when he saves. Similarly, there can be immediate pleasure with schoolwork and other valued behaviors, even though we think that the reinforcement is only in the distant future. It's not that others have to invent immediate reinforcements when there is none. The issue is to figure out why individuals are not currently reinforced to do socially valued behaviors in the same ways they learn about dinosaurs, monster trucks, and read strategy guides for their games. It's also conjecture, not fact, that individuals need an inhibitory response to maintain achievement and socially appropriate behavior. Traditionalists assert that most people have a competent inhibitory response which protects them from future harm, while individuals diagnosed with ADHD don't have this biological safeguarding. But what traditionalists don't tell us is how a person or a person's brain knows when and when not to inhibit. Without that specification, the explanation becomes indeterminate and useless. It simply comes out of thin air in a mysterious fashion. As noted throughout, if a person is impeding their actions, they already know that there's a problem with what they're doing. The impeding doesn't allow that awareness. So if we drop the inadequate inhibitory hypothesis, what might be another way to account for ADHD patterns of behavior? Well, in the current view, Diagnosed individuals don't possess an inferior inhibitory mechanism. They are conditioned differently. Whether they stop or go depends on their past learning exposures. Contrary to what traditionalists think, they are enacting what they know. In this view, ADHD is not taxed by certain kinds of situations, nor is it compensated for in other situations. ADHD is not ever-present and lurking. It's simply that people learn different reactions in different situations and circumstances with schoolwork, when excluded, when directed, when failing, when criticized, when asked to play, when pursuing a hobby, when denied or limited, or when candy is made available to them. However, it's now popular to believe that when people respond in ways we call ADHD and do it often enough for it to be problematic, we say that they have ADHD. But what do they have other than what they frequently do? However, it's often difficult to get people to give up their traditional beliefs about ADHD and adopt a new perspective. According to Dr. Kalmanson, when WebMD says that if your child has ADHD, don't blame yourself, ADHD is a brain disorder, it's luring you in by telling you what you want to hear, that you're excused for any mistakes that you made in raising your kid. And when it says if you have adult ADHD, it can make it hard for you to succeed. Well, it's letting you off the hook for any failures or bad choices that may have happened. Your label authorizes you to rationalize all of your troubles as being due to bad genes or a defective brain and hardwiring, and thus it's prefated and out of your control. You're therefore never again to feel guilty or remorseful about anything. Now, Dr. Kelmanson's concerns are not always the case, but clearly this alternative understanding is not in vogue. 
But it is a reasonable way to interpret ADHD based on parsimony, consistency, coherence, and precision and scope. An important thought. Is ADHD incurable as traditionalists claim? Or are the poor outcomes the consequence of treatments that are not producing impressive longer term results? It's important for individuals diagnosed with ADHD to develop skills, but it's also important for them to develop relationships with others which are enduring enough to withstand hardship. That alone might help to ameliorate many ADHD behaviors. It's also important for us to help individuals diagnosed with ADHD develop their brains rather than rely upon us to repeat what has been said, remind them, offer solutions, or direct their actions. Yes, medication and coercion help in the short term, but those interventions seem to peter out over time and produce unwanted side effects. It seems as if more functionality might be developed by having the individual learn to be more willing and eager to do socially valued behaviors and achievements. Given the lackluster, longer-term outcomes of traditional interventions, what's the downside of adopting a self-reliant, cooperative approach? If you'd like to learn more about my work, you can visit my website, and you can also find out more about the references used in this video series under the Presentations tab.